Dr. Morgan, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about our conversation. Yeah, likewise. So maybe we could start by you just introducing yourself and giving everyone a bit of a feel for what you do and the kinds of people that you usually help in your work. Yes, I am Dr. Morgan Anderson. I am the host of the Let's Get Vulnerable podcast, and I help women heal and have high self-worth so that they can attract the relationships they deserve. Mm -hmm. I, in my, I call it like my former life, I was a clinical psychologist. I still am a clinical psychologist. And then I saw how big of a gap there was in terms of attachment theory and people knowing about attachment theory and how to apply it to their mm -hmm. dating lives. And I started this, this coaching business about four years ago and now have had the pleasure of coaching over 500 women and helping them become more securely attached and step into their high self-worth version of themselves so it's been a wild ride the last four years, and I, I love what I do. And of course, as, as you know, Stephanie, for a lot of us who are drawn to this field, this really was a calling for me because it was my own personal struggle. I was for, just going to ask, <laughs> I was going to say, is there know. that thread of like personal story that led you to really knowing how deeply this was needed and having walked that path yourself? Yes, isn't that the case for those of us that really yeah. run with this? It starts with the with the personal story and that was certainly the case for me of experiencing childhood trauma that then led me to really painful dating patterns all through my 20s. And then I tell people that my rock bottom moment really was when I was dating a narcissist and that relationship just got to a very unhealthy place. And I was kind of at that fork in the road of, I can keep doing this, but I know I'm causing so much damage to myself. And this, every relationship I go through is just getting more and more painful. Mm -hmm. um, so at that rock bottom place, I decided I need to heal. And I really threw myself into researching attachment theory and ways to rewire your belief system. I'm really happy to say I'm three years into a wonderful, healthy, securely attached partnership. And mm. I think if it's possible for me, it's really possible for anyone. Mm. Yeah. It sounds like there are some common threads in our respective stories there because I had a similar experience of you know, when I was younger, my first two long-term relationships were, I think just probably by pure luck were quite healthy. <laughs> Um, but then I had this relationship in my mid-20s, uh, which was really not healthy at all. Very dysfunctional, like very classic anxious avoidant, uh, mm -hmm. you know, every expression of that dynamic. And it was really only through that experience, you know, as stressful as it was, and I look back and it's quite amazing to me that I persisted in it because I stayed in it for three years. Uh, amazing to me that I persisted through so much dysfunction. And so much just like striving and pushing and, you know, all the time, every day. Um, but I really don't regret it at all because it was that that pushed me to the brink. And in a funny sort of way, I, I can look back now and see that the patterns that really came to the fore in that relationship were sort of latent in me in those earlier relationships, but they sort of weren't brought out as much because the relationship was more secure uh, mm -hmm. But it was only in really seeing those parts of myself that were exacerbated through that dynamic that I was able to then go, okay, this needs my attention. <laughs> I guess as much as it's yes. uh, a nice story to tell myself that like it's all his fault because he's just a bad guy. Like there's a part of me that's getting something out of this because I didn't yes. just like walk away at the start, right? There were all of the signs there and I, for some reason, was attracted to that challenge. Yes. And so I think that you know, having those experiences, it's not like we need to go and seek out awful relationships for the sake of growth. But I think when we can look back and go, okay, there's something in this that's more than just, oh, I just attract all the bad guys. It's like, well, what, what is it within me that is attracted to that? 
And I yes. think that really gives us a lot of fertile ground for growth and self-exploration and, and healing if we're brave enough to do that work. Oh, so, so powerful for you to share that. It makes me think about the concept repetition compulsion, Yeah, which, you know, where we are in our adult relationships repeating unfinished business from our childhoods. And yes, there are those relationships like the one you described where it is your unfinished business just staring at you. You can't avoid it. And you, you see those wounds that have never been examined or never been healed. And yes, it is an opportunity to do that deeper work so that we can then intentionally go into our future relationships. So it's a, it's a very empowering way to look at it. And I do, I am, I'm incredibly grateful for that relationship that I went through because Yes, it was probably my most toxic relationship and it is the one that that made me say this pattern has to stop and to yeah. finally really see my wounds. Um so yeah, I'm I'm with you. I have now I have a lot of gratitude for it at the time <laughs> I didn't, but now I do. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So is there kind of an archetype of person who you're seeing again and again? Like who are the kinds of people that you're working with? What are the things they're struggling with? Um, is there a pretty clear pattern or a few key patterns that you're seeing? Yeah, a lot of the people that I work with have found themselves in relationships that don't end well or relationships that don't meet their needs or they're constantly attracted to that, to that emotionally unavailable partner who mm -hmm. can't meet them. I, I work with both anxiously attached and avoidantly attached individuals and also a lot of disorganized attachment. As you know, uh, that's really common in my work since that's so connected to early childhood trauma. Um, and I, I think that, that oftentimes with disorganized attachment, we can just find ourselves in really painful dynamics. And then those folks are a little bit more motivated to, to seek help. So yeah. a lot of disorganized attachment. But, but women will come to me when they say, okay, I've blamed the dating pool. I've blamed all, all the guys, but now I'm taking ownership. I am the common denominator. Mm -hmm. I want to own my role in this. Um, yeah. And they're so ready to heal and do the work and they just don't want to be in pain in their relationships anymore. Yeah. That sense of exasperation of like, surely it's not meant to be this hard. <laughs> yes. I'm looking around me and it feels like other people are managing to do this. And despite my best intentions and the fact that I really want a relationship, why does it keep ending the same way? Why do I keep finding myself? And I think, you know, a lot of what I see and hear from people is, you know, they're attracted to someone that really seems all kind of picture perfect until it isn't. And you know, not only is that painful to play out, but every time you play it out, your self-trust just kind of withers, right? Your, you know, ability yes. to go, oh, do I just have like terrible judgment because I thought things were one way and now it's this 180. And so then that really erodes my sense of self moving yes. into the next relationship and the next person I meet uh, because I'm scared of my own, like scared of myself, right? Scared of my patterns. And so it, there's like this internal vigilance of just like, like this barren self-trust environment. Uh, and I think that when we combine that with like general anxiety or, you know, I, I talk a lot about how I think much of the time when we're afraid of something, like we're afraid of our own feelings. I, I don't, I don't want to experience that because of like the embarrassment or the rejection or the shame or the hurt that I might feel if that yeah. thing comes to pass. And so we just end up in overdrive and it sucks all of the joy out of it. And so I think there's just like from all of these angles, um, people are having a really hard time navigating this and it doesn't feel like it's getting any easier. Oh, I love that you mentioned this about self-trust. That is mm -hmm. such a key. And, and I do think that that's a common thread in, mm -hmm. in people that I work with is just that 
disconnection from self and being, being unable to tell, okay, what is my, what is my past trauma or what is my insecure attachment style versus what is my inner knowing? What is the truth? What is, what is my gut? And I know when you get to that place, it does, it just makes dating exhausting. And, and then you get a lot of people who overcorrect and they say, I'm never going to date again. And they're not in the dating scene, right? They're giving up on love and just going to travel the world with their girlfriends. But then at the end of the day, they admit to themselves, they do want partnership and, and they realize, okay, I, I have to go about dating differently. Um, and I, I think that speaking of self-trust for so many people, you probably find this, like it started early on that disconnection from self. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, um, one of the hardest things and something I hear time and time again, and something I've experienced myself is like, how can I trust myself when I had this paranoia or this fear? And it came to fruition. And so it's like banking mm -hmm. evidence in favor of the fear story that's telling me I was right. And so that protective part of me that's on the lookout, that's hypervigilant, that's snooping or that's paranoid, when it gets proven right by an experience or a relationship, then that only bolsters you know, the yeah. perceived importance of that pattern going forward. It's really hard from that place to go, okay, I'm going to just drop that and stop doing it because it feels like it's serving such an important protective function. And so I think there's like all of these, you know, pieces that are operating there to keep us really entrenched in our patterns and we just keep spinning around in them. Yes. Oh, it's so, it's so, so true. And I love, I love when people start to build self-trust and they're, they're gaining that inner knowing and they're, hopefully moving towards secure attachment. I see those things as being so interconnected. Um, and they're able to feel when something is off early on. I've had so many clients who go, oh my gosh, now that I've done this work and I'm moving towards secure attachment, I know that I just saved myself six months of games, six months of heartache. I felt it early on. I trusted myself. And something that in the past I would have just predicted it and catastrophized, and yes, it would have happened, I was able to just remove myself early on. Yeah. And I, I think there's so much, oh gosh, it's just such a big win to me when we know what to invest our energy into early on and we can feel it. It's, I guess it's preventative heartbreak. Yeah. I yeah. love that so much. Yeah, I think that you, it's probably not something that happens overnight, but you can, over time doing this work, take stock and go, yeah, things that used to be attractive to me, I'm just so not interested in. <laughs> that kind yeah. of game playing or just that kind of energy, like flakiness, inconsistency doesn't do anything for me anymore in a way that it would have once upon a time really lit my system up and, yeah. you know, sent me into some sort of like made me go in for more to investigate or to try and clarify or to you know, gather information. It's just like you sort of, that falls away a bit and you cease to be drawn to that kind of dynamic because, you know, you've built enough of the new stuff within you that that's like, oh, that doesn't feel like a fit anymore for like where yeah. I'm at, where I'm going. Yes. I love that so much when you can start to feel that shift within you of being attracted to secure attachment and a securely attached relationship. Yeah. I, I remember when I was doing this work on myself and feeling like, where did all of these good, emotionally available men come from? Did they just fall from the sky? Where have they been? The, like the reality was I just wasn't attracted to them when I was in my disorganized attachment place. Hmm. So it's so true that I mean, we can really change who we are attracted to and what what kind of relationship dynamic is attractive yeah. to us. Yeah. I I posted something yesterday, which was from a previous podcast episode, and it was along the lines of when we've been 
in those really inconsistent kind of chaotic dysfunctional relationships you know that intermittent reinforcement that we get is so addictive and so when we then start to you know step towards healthier relationships it can feel like it's just not doing much for us um it, you know in those early transitional stages when you're doing this work and i think a lot of people will experience that and relate to that this sense of healthy feeling boring at first yes. um, when your system yes. is really calibrated to spikes and chaos and you know the person who is kind of you know mean to you or doesn't meet your needs or is really unavailable you know, most of the time but then you know like they turn up and they take you out to dinner that's going to feel so much better for your system when you're used to that then the person who takes you out to dinner every week and is really consistent and available, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So recognizing that, recognizing that that's a powerful system and being really conscious about like, which part of myself do I want in the driver's seat here? The part that is going to respond really automatically to those old patterns. Uh, do I want to be led by that kind of like pinball machine lighting up inside me and just follow the feeling? Or do I want to make really conscious decisions in the direction of what I know is best for me, what I know is right for me? Um, because I think if we do just keep following those familiar feelings, we're going to follow them down familiar paths to familiar dynamics with familiar yeah. relationships. How we know how we ends. want. Yeah. yeah. And then we go, oh, why does this keep happening to me? Exactly. Well, <laughs> I, lo I love that you're talking about this. We talk about this in my community a lot. And one of the sayings I have is secure is sexy mm -hmm. um, because it is part of that rewiring the brain to adjust to a new normal to say, mm -hmm. wow, emotional availability is really attractive and yeah. starting to learn that there's different levels of intimacy that come with that and a, a different kind of intimacy that is stable and predictable. And, and I think what we find, and I, I don't know, this is my own personal experience, my client's experience, maybe you relate to this, of when, when you've been in that for a while and you're starting to normalize into it, you then see, oh, wow, this is, this is really attractive. This is really amazing and, and really different from anything I've had before. And I don't even know how to really put it into words, but you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, it's like this deep nourishment that your system can actually just rest yes. in relationships. And yes. I think if you've always had a lot of insecurity, if that's been kind of the dominant force of your relationships has been yes. stress and insecurity, that's probably just like the medicine that you didn't realize how deeply you needed it to actually just be able yes. to rest in the safety I, of a relationship. Oh. I love that word rest because yeah. the word that comes to me is relax, that that yeah. ability to relax into love and to create a partnership that really feels like home, that yeah. is easy. There's there's so much joy and, and love that comes from that, that so many people with relational trauma in their childhoods have probably never experienced that kind of relationship before yeah. um so so of course really there's to trust in it right it's yes. it's really hard to trust that it's real and so we can go so quickly to like trying to find the problem or trying to yeah. you know find where it's all going to fall apart when's the other shoe going to drop yeah um, when's it all going to go south because that's just what we know and that's what we've been really primed to expect right yes and people who are becoming secure will have extinction bursts. You've heard of that term mm -hmm. where you're learning this new behavior, you're becoming securely attached, and then your brain goes, hey, but what about this insecure attachment behavior? What about all these old protest behaviors that we've used before? Are you sure you don't want these? And then they come back with a vengeance, right? So like I have these women that I'm helping and they'll say, oh my gosh, I was doing so well. And then all of a sudden I had this huge anxious attachment spiral and really that's extinction bursts. 
of the brain saying, well, hey, this was our old way of being. This worked for us for a really long time. Are you sure you don't want this? Yeah. Well, I think when we've got like those protective strategies that feel so deeply etched into us, it's like muscle memory. It's like if you're right-handed, yeah. you're learning to write with your left hand and it's just like, oh, the pull to the old way. There are those parts mm-hmm. of you that really are protective, right, and were once adaptive. Um, it can feel really scary for those parts to feel like you're trying to make them go away. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. you know, you are bad and I'm going to make you stop now. Uh, it's why I really emphasize you know, approaching ourselves with self-compassion and, you know, not being like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm so fucked up. I'm so broken. I've just got to stop being so anxious or I've got to stop being so scared. It's like, oh, it makes yeah. a lot of sense, right? My anxiety, what's my anxiety trying to keep me safe from? What's my anxiety trying to tell me? Um, and recognizing that that part of you or those parts of you have been working really tirelessly to keep you safe for a really long time. Um, and that that's not something we need to like make go away. We just need to maybe look at whether that's still adaptive to our current situation and environment and what we're working towards. And to the extent that it isn't, it's like, well, okay, can I come up with some new tools and new ways of doing things that are maybe a better fit for where I am and where I'm going? Absolutely. When we are critical or we shame those parts of ourselves, we just maintain them and then we can make them bigger. We make them come out sideways. So Mm. 100% agree with you of compassion, kindness, curiosity, being willing to explore, you know, what, what's the story I'm telling myself there? What, what needs a little bit more healing? What's the wound that's coming up? Right. Mm. Um, And then I, I teach this in in my program about how do we then have compassion and then say how do i realign with the securely attached version of me mm. and what is what is my current healthy coping look like mm. but so many people they don't do the compassion right they're just beating themselves up and then they just want to try to move back to a healthier version but but we know you you won't be able to move through things without that compassion. It's so needed. Yeah, I mean, I think I often say like the the shame. It's just layering like more and more stress onto a system that's already in a lot of stress. Yeah, it's like if I'm just making yeah. myself wrong for everything about my experience, and when you know, unworthiness and low self esteem is already at the heart of a lot of that, you know, punishing ourselves, beating ourselves up criticizing ourselves, not going to make that better, right? That's just going to you know, make that feel more true, all of our stories of low self-esteem, low self-worth. So I think that recognizing that we have to turn things around there and that really starts within, yes. it's going to be very hard to do any kind of meaningful growth or healing work from a place of shame and self-criticism. It's so it just tends not to work very well. It's so true. It's so true. And then I think once once people are in that more secure place or they've done some of that that inner work and they're they're building their their self-worth, then what I know we we probably both see is where people start to have new relationship experiences. I I call these corrective emotional experiences, right? And what I love about that is then you're gaining evidence for the healthy relationship, for the secure relationship. Um, And I know how significant that is for people in their healing process. Yeah. And I I would say that's true. Even if, you know, you don't go on to like be in a long-term relationship and marry the person, it's just like, can I allow myself to really receive the goodness of this experience irrespective of what happens? I think the more we shift away from some of those insecure patterns, the more we can just be open to presence and curiosity in the dating process, in getting to know someone. And even if it's not a great fit, uh, you might just find yourself really nourished by a connection over dinner and talking to someone and feeling a level of authenticity and confidence within yourself. Like that can be a beautiful corrective experience, you know, even if it doesn't you know, yes. go anywhere or nothing becomes of it. 
Uh, I think that Ooh, yes. the more thinking we are, then the more we can take all of that in and really receive it and receive the benefit of it. Whereas when we're in that really constricted, anxious space, it's just such a strong negative bias. It's so it's like everything feels like a failure or a setback or, you know, just not, yeah. not perfect. And that's what we're trained to see. And that's really what we take in. Oh, I love that you're talking about this because one of the things I would want to share is this idea that really healthy, secure attachment is the foundation in dating. And so many of us, if we don't have that foundation, we're getting stuck in those anxious avoidant or unhealthy relationship patterns. And that's kind of really easy to pull us in and just get us stuck in that place. But when we have secure as the foundation, then we get to this really juicy, fun, exciting level of dating where we're able to actually look at compatibility and values and how do I want to feel? It's almost like the next level. Um, I know for a fact when I was in an insecure attachment place, dating was just kind of this challenge and I was so wrapped up in fear of abandonment that I just wanted to make somebody like me and choose me. I yeah. couldn't access compatibility because I was so focused just on that attachment level. So yeah. I, I just think it's so powerful when, just as you said, you get to a secure place, you're in this abundance mindset, you know your worth, and then you're just exploring compatibility and values and do I even like this person? Is this someone where our lifestyles match up, right? Like it's just such a juicier, more yeah. fun place to be. Yeah. And I think that everything you say there around like the the sole criterion being like, does this person like me? <laughs> For a lot of people, particularly with more anxious attachment patterns, it's just like, they really like me. So great, let's go. And there's no yeah. sense of reciprocity around like, am I? scoping out whether I like them or am I just feeling really, you know, flattered, lit out, like that deeply unworthy part of me loves the attention uh, and loves, you know, someone pursuing me. And that's kind of all I need to get myself hooked into the pattern. And I think that when we tend to that part of us so that it's not so susceptible to those little bursts of, of ego attention, uh, then the much better place we are to have like a balanced approach where we are, you know, there and we're thinking about like, as you say, how do I want to feel? What are my values? You know, what are my non-negotiables? What are the things that are really important to me in a partner, in a relationship? Um, and I think the other side of that, it's kind of this balancing act of we want to have clarity and we want to be able to advocate for those things. And we don't want to be too rigid or prescriptive. Like we want to be open to being surprised by someone. Um, and I think that having that secure base within ourselves allows us to walk that line in a way that, as you say, is kind of fun or you know, at least feels like a totally different energy to a very constricted, anxious, rigid way of doing things, which is just you know, kind of bracing for fear and trying to get someone to like us, um, which yeah. is... You know, not fun, right? Yes. I, th I think about this deep knowing of, hey, if I've already chosen myself and I, I know my worth and I, I've released some of my unfinished business from the past, then I can really approach dating with this blank slate. And I'm, I'm not here trying to get you to choose me. You know, I've I've chosen myself and it, it is just such a different approach. Yeah. And I, I imagine as well, like a key piece of that is I'm not making it mean anything about me at a fundamental level if you like me or you don't, or like no. what it, however it plays out. I can be somewhat no, it's not that we become immune to that. I think, you know, you can be really securely attached and still have hurt feelings or be disappointed or, you know upset yes. if something doesn't work out and you were really excited about it but you don't take that additional step of like what's wrong with me this always happens no one's ever going to like me those like you know old stories that come up and drag us down I think you can just be with that whatever the emotion is without taking that additional step of telling really painful stories about yourself and letting that impact your worth at a really fundamental level 
Oh, it's so true. So, so true. And I think about all of my years of, I'll call it unconscious dating, where I did have all those negative beliefs about myself. And I would just use whatever negative experiences happened to me in dating as ways to confirm those really unhealthy beliefs about myself. So our brains are very good at looking to confirm whatever we believe and that we look to our environment. So that's why I really believe in doing this healing work and looking at your belief systems and Mm -hmm. releasing your past so that when you do go into dating, it's a blank slate. Yeah. Um, Wiped down by all of that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if we were to pivot to giving people a bit of a sense of the how on all of this, we've done, I feel like we've painted the picture of like why you'd want to do it and what's possible. Um, What does the how look like? I love this question. I think it's a very important one. One of the first pieces is the commitment of I really do want to work on myself and I know how important this work is. So just making that decision and releasing expectations on how long it's going to take, it is a journey. So I think that's very important of I make the commitment however long it takes. Mm -hmm. Uh, The second piece would be awareness. You, You have to understand what are my current patterns? What is my attachment style? And then I take my clients through something called a relationship inventory where we really look at all the dynamics of past significant relationships. That's part of the awareness piece, processing those old woundings and, and being willing to look at it. I'm, I'm not one of those coaches who's going to come on here and say, oh, just write out the life that you want and say your affirmations and then you'll have exactly what you want. You know, that's not how healing works. The only way forward is through, as you know. So I, I really believe in examining our, our past in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, intention setting is great and conscious awareness is great. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, like there's a doing piece here. We actually have to like step out into the world and let our system our being like live out another version of things because if we have a lot of evidence banked up as to why our old beliefs or our old experiences are true and you know the only way then like no amount of journaling or you know visioning is gonna be enough to shift that it's a really great start but it's it's only part of the story there. And I think that having that lived experience um, is invaluable. Like we really can't I, I land in that new reality until we're feeling it in our body in a really like experiential way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So yeah, definitely the awareness piece, feeling, being willing to show up differently with behaviors as you're describing and showing up with new ways of being. I also really, really believe in um, identifying your securely attached identity. So Uh getting really familiar with what would secure attachment look like in practice. So many of us don't have that model. We wouldn't even know what it would be. Uh, So really defining your securely attached identity and then using self-compassion use it to realign with that securely attached self when needed. So I guess those are some of the core things. I know we could probably spend a few hours going over the exact path, but I I really believe in awareness, rewire your brain with really healthy beliefs about yourself and relationships, learn about your securely attached identity create that very clearly and then practice showing up differently. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would also add to that something that I will often say to people is like when you're working on building your self-worth in relationships or in dating, it can really help to work on building your self-worth outside of that context as well. So it's like, because I think that if you're, particularly if you're again, more anxious in your patterns and your tendency is for like all roads to lead back to relationships right 
everything I'm doing, I'm doing it to find a partner and to be loved. And so I think sometimes if we're really laser focused on that, it can, even if we're doing all these good work, can be with like the strings attached of I'm doing it so that someone will love me. <laughs> and so I think there can be a huge benefit in broadening out our scope and going, okay, securely attached version of me would also have all of these other things going on in my life, right? And I'd have, maybe I'd, I'd be practicing more self-discipline in other areas. Maybe I'd be challenging myself. Maybe I'd be, you know, taking up a hobby or a whatever, yeah. but not having it all be in this like very narrow funnel that is about securing a partner. Um, because I think the reality yeah. is that securely attached people do have much more balanced lives. Um, yeah. And that sense of self-worth is not just relational in nature. It's really essential to your identity and your self-image. Um, and so I, I think that can be hugely helpful and pay really big dividends to like broaden out the lens a little. And I know for me that that was a really big piece in building that up for myself and eventually leaving that relationship that I was in was that I was not even really focused on the relationship so much. I think I'd started to kind of detach from it, but I didn't quite have the courage or the confidence to pull the trigger and leave. But in the background, I was doing all of this stuff to really focus on, you know, I suppose, anchoring in my own value and my own efficacy and capability and these things right. that were not like about love or romance or partnership. They were just about like, no, you're, you're a valuable person and you're, you've got this, right? You're strong and you're capable. Um, and I think that having those experiences in a kind of broad way can be really, really helpful when it comes back to all of this stuff. I love that you that you mentioned this. It's so powerful. I wrote a, a quote um, that that did well on, on social media, and I think it's because it's a metaphor for this idea, but I said something along the lines of um, the kind of the kind of relationship where you're not my entire world, but you're my favorite continent to visit. Yeah, because I I really love that idea. We we cannot have our relationship be our entire world. It's not yeah. healthy for us. It's not healthy for our partners. My my partner and I three years together. We do something called solo Saturdays. Mm. We go do whatever really fills us up as individuals on on Saturdays, and we know that we need that time, and it's incredibly important. Uh, He's a fly fisherman. He loves fly fishing. And in my old relationships, I know I would have tried to force myself to take on his hobby to <laughs> learn how to fly fish. Yeah, I can't totally. tell you how grateful I am that I am in this secure place. I am not buying a, a fly fishing rod. I'm not learning to fly fish. I celebrate that that's his. And, yeah. and I have my own hobbies um, and it is very important to maintain that sense of self and you as the individual, knowing yeah. that that is so, so important to, to your own happiness and also to your ability to, to be a good partner. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think the more that you can, you know, if you're single at the moment, cultivate that really proactively and consciously and use that time when you do have more space to really figure that out for yourself because I think it's easy to fall into relationships and to get a little bit lazy and to kind of collapse into the relationship and to kind of do everything together. It's like figuring that out while you're single. It's not that you can't do it while you're in a relationship, but it's a beautiful opportunity to figure that out while you're single and then be really you know, aware of it and be really kind of diligent about keeping up those things because, you know, if for no other reason than, yeah, like I think it's so rewarding on an individual kind of self level, but it's also much better for the relationship. It's much more attractive to have that separateness and to have distinctive yes. lives rather than just to be kind of one entity. Again, I think the insecure parts of us, particularly the more anxious patterns, love that idea of just let's enmesh and become one and then I'll feel safe because I'll have my claws sunk into you so deeply then I'll always know where you are, and what you're doing, and, and I'll never lose you, right? Um, yes. But it, it's not 
It's not sexy. <laughs> it's not it's sustainable. Suck, suck the oxygen out of it. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think there's really a lot more to be gained from like very deliberately fostering and holding on to that yeah. you know, full, vibrant sense of self and then to be able to enjoy that in each other and appreciate Absolutely. that rather than becoming complacent and, and sloppy about those things. It's so true. Desire needs a bridge to cross. As yeah. Esther Perel says, we, you know, we need, we need that distance to be able to create desire. I yeah. say something much less um, sophisticated than that. I always say <laughs> boundaries are hot. They yeah. really are. Boundaries are very attractive. So yeah. knowing what your boundaries are with your time um, and being able to maintain that no matter where you are in a relationship. I think that is one of the things that leads to healthy long-term relationships. Yeah, agreed. What would you say to people who are in the early stages of dating someone and who experience that urge to just fast track everything, to get to that place of certainty and kind of lock it down? <laughs> because that in-between space can feel really anxiety-inducing, can feel really wobbly. What would yeah. be your advice for people who are in that kind of interim phase of dating? I I definitely have a few pieces. One is something I call reality testing. It's something that's using cognitive behavioral therapy of slowing down and actually taking stock of what is the reality here? How much time have I spent with this person? What do I actually know about them? Um Given, given where we are, what is the appropriate emotional investment? And one way I like to really frame this is, is there enough secure attachment in the relationship, aka do I know this person well enough? Have they earned my vulnerability, right? Has that been established enough to support the level of emotional investment? So, so sort of thinking about it as like the foundation of a house, if it's not there, then I, I can't build on it and reminding yourself, you owe it to yourself to slow down, let yeah. someone earn your vulnerability, let someone show you that they can build secure attachment and really pace your emotional investment. Yeah. Um, Which can feel so counterintuitive for a lot of people, right? It's like, the opposite of everything that their body's telling them to do, which is like faster, 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 yeah. faster. Let's like jump ahead to the part where we've said, I love you and we move in together and I don't have to deal with all of this uncertainty. Um, but as you say, I think like that skipping ahead can come at a cost because you just, you're kind of building the walls without the foundation there to use your analogy. Yeah. Um, and that typically comes back to bite you. You realize that like it, you haven't really yeah. done the the legwork to justify the level of emotional attachment and investment that you've poured into this thing. And then, you know, if it does crash and burn, it's going to hurt a lot more because we, we had so much riding on it. There was so much pressure on it. There was so much investment that was maybe just disproportionate to reality. Exactly. Exactly. And think about yourself as an intentional investor you know we'd, we'd say that with the stock market it's no different with your relationships of hey i need to really know is this right for me and your energy your time your love that is your most valuable resource so really just seeing it as hey i really do need to be intentional with how i'm investing this and just like in the stock market we want return on investment uh, in relationships, it's, is this creating secure attachment? Is this something that can grow? Do I feel how I want to feel? You need to be willing to slow down and, and be that love scientist that's gathering the data on those things. Um, and yes, it is so hard when that's not what you're used to doing. It can feel so foreign. Um, but remember, if you want a different result, you have to show up differently. Yeah. And I, I think also like, you know, just reminding yourself that that urgency is like, that's not a reliable feeling, right? 
Um, and that's probably not what we want to be just blindly following. You know, I think for a lot of people, it's like, but if I slow down, what if they lose interest? It's like, probably not going to happen. And if it does, then that wasn't the person, right? If it's that like feeble and, and flimsy that, yeah. you know, you slowing down and pacing this appropriately means they lose interest, then like, that's really good information too, not your person. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so like if it's as amazing as it feels, it will still be there at, at a more sustainable pace uh, and it will probably be all the more amazing for you slowing down and taking that time. Uh, but as you say, I think that like when we're trying to forge a new path, like we have to be really prepared to not just do things because we feel a certain way, you know, really like, well, I feel this, so I have to act in that way. As well, you, you have a little bit more agency than that. And reminding yourself of, of your capacity to choose something different, uh, as strong as the feelings might be, and it might be so overpowering, so overwhelming, but just like mm-hmm. grounding yourself, coming back. Okay. As you say, yeah. like right here, right now, what do I know to be true? What choices do I have available to me? You know, what's the right thing for me to do? And, and hopefully on the other side of that process of kind of reorienting and grounding, it feels a little more spacious and a little less urgent and catastrophic. Absolutely. I, I love how you describe that. I, I think about this in real life of, okay, you have the decision. What would that securely attached version of me do? And they probably wouldn't send the 17 text messages. They would go to yoga with their friends like they had planned, right? Like, we, we always have that option of how am I showing up? What, what am I aligning with? And I'll tell you this, I think some of the first times you start to slow down and intentionally decide how empowering that is and learning, oh, I can slow down. I don't have to let my anxious brain or my avoidant brain decide what I do. I can be intentional and decide differently. Yeah. It's almost like, knowing that your your first thought is going to be probably coming from the old part and just like waiting for the second thought. Right? Yeah. Kind of slow it down and, and not just like, you know, shoot from the hip because it's, there's yes. a really good chance that like that fear brain is going to be sending you down an old path that you know, might not be where you want to yes. be headed. So just exactly. knowing that about yourself, and I suppose it, it comes back to that self-awareness. Uh, and that was, you know, a huge part of my journey in my growth is just like being able to notice it being like oh that that's my anxious brain telling me to do the anxious thing um and I don't have to follow that I can actually choose something different I think the more it's like you know doing reps of a an exercise at the gym like the more reps you do the easier it feels the more confident you are in that being an option available to you and you know, over time, the new way feels more natural than the old way. And that's a really powerful thing to experience. It is. I love that you said that. That's so true. And I think early on, it's hard to believe that. But but we know that to be true, that it really can become your more natural way of being. Thank yeah. goodness. I know. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really is something for me. That, like when I think back to some of the things that I would do by default that now would be so unnatural, like in conflict or it's just like, I wouldn't reach for those things anymore. It's not how we do things because I've actually got yeah. this new way that works a lot better for me. and doesn't cost my system so much. And there's a lot of peace and relief in, in having that. So it's very important work. Yes, it is. Yeah. And wow, what a gift you've given to your community. I've had the pleasure of listening to your show and I'm just, I'm just amazed at how much you've put out there and how, how good you are at explaining everything and sharing. Um, I, I know you've helped so, so many people on, on their healing path. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And likewise, it sounds like you're doing a lot of really important work and much needed. I know that so many listeners of the show are very much in this space and experiencing a lot of those patterns and, and repeat dynamics. So I'm sure there's a lot of people who are going to get a lot of value out of today's conversation. Before we wrap up, uh, where can people find you if they want to go deeper on your work or familiarize themselves with your podcast, Instagram, all of that sort of stuff? 
Yes. Thank you so much for having me. And really the best place to connect with me is on my podcast with um, over 400 episodes now. It's the Let's Get Vulnerable podcast available anywhere podcasts are aired. And then I do also spend some time on Instagram and that is at Dr. Morgan Coaching, Dr. Morgan Coaching. So happy to answer DMs um, and I do a daily informational post there. But the podcast really is where all the, the juicy stuff is. So check out the Let's Get Vulnerable podcast. Perfect. And we will link all of that in the show notes. Well, Dr. Morgan, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. It's been so lovely to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This was lovely.